ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending this OXTS webinar. Um, thanks for, uh, for giving us some time. Um, hope you're all well and getting used to this odd situation we all find ourselves in. We're all working from home, so um, I hope this, uh, this rolls through uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> this is the first in a series of webinars that we intend to provide. Um, to get us all through uh, these, these awkward working situation we find ourselves in. So please watch out on our social channels, watch the OXGS website, and please keep in touch with our partners, Navtech GPS and Datron and DTC for more information about both the product and the upcoming future webinars. So today we would have been at ILMF in Washington with our partner Navtech GPS. And I know that some of you would have dropped by to say hello. So given this is a different kind of presentation, um, we're gonna we're gonna do this short webinar on the OXTS georeferencer software. Software was launched officially at the beginning of March, uh, so it's brand new. Um, and some of the tools that accompany it, and one of, in particular, being the Boresight Alignment Tool. So we all know that the alignment of your LiDAR data and your INS data from multiple passes of a site can be very, very tricky and can create some um, inaccuracies in the data. So OXTS have created an application tool that can analyze your point data from a known object and bring those devices into alignment and then allow you to use those same offsets to be applied to the rest of your data set. So if I can ask if you have any questions, can you um, put them into the chat section um, or even ask them at the end, we can, um, we can open up the floor. So now I'm gonna hand you across to Jake who will take you through Boresight Alignment Solution. Okay, thanks, Pete. So, hi, everybody. As Pete mentioned, my name is Jake, and I am the product engineer for OXTS Survey. And welcome to this webinar on the topic of our Boresight calibration solution. So, we are Oxford Technical Solutions, or OXTS, and we have over 20 years of experience in getting the best navigation data from our iconic red box INS devices. You'll probably know that you need to pair your LiDAR with an INS to get not just the best position data, but also orientation data. So we've been doing this for over 20 years from before LiDAR surveying was really a thing. And now we are the only INS manufacturer to have a Boresight calibration solution. So the problem, boresight misalignment, what is it? So the problem is when you have an imprecision in the angles that you measure between your LiDAR and your INS. So when you are using an INS with your LiDAR, you need to measure the position and the angles relative to the INS that the LiDAR is at. And when you have an imprecision here, you get a distortion in your point cloud. And crucially, a tiny imprecision can cause a significant distortion. And to get the angles accurate enough can often be very difficult or impossible by eye unless you have some mounting solution. And so you need a data-driven calibration technique, and that's what we've provided. So why is this a problem? So if you are with your LiDAR, viewing some objects, say this black rectangle in the, in the top here, from one side and one direction, let's say from the uh, left side, where you see this red um, field of view of the LiDAR, you will see a distorted and displaced version of that object, which you see in this red rectangle. And then from another direction, you'll see, in, as you do in the blue rectangle, that it that the object is displaced and distorted, but in a different direction. And over time in a survey, these distortions will be overlaid on top of each other, 
just like this. And over time, you'll get a end result, which is a blurred image. You'll get a distorted, a stretched out um, version of the object that you are looking at. So as a quick calculation, we have at the bottom here just some trigonometry. If you have a 0 0.2 degree angle error, then in a point 10 meters away, you would have a position error of approximately seven centimeters. That's a tiny angle error, giving you a, for many applications, significant position error. So that's all good for theory, but how is it in practice? And the short answer is that this is a very real problem for doing LIDAR surveying and it's fatal for many applications. So if you can't measure your angles to about 0.1 degrees, you can often get unusable or very bad point cloud data at the end of your survey. And the worst outcome of this is double vision, so-called, and we'll have an example of that on the next slide. So here you can see an example of double vision. So these are two targets, not four. There are only two of these square targets that you should be able to see in this point cloud. So this is from a UAV flying over these two targets, forwards and then backwards, or north and then south. And it's about 50 meter um, above the ground. And there was about a five degree error on some of these axes that the user had measured by eye using an XNAV 550 and a VLP 16. This is what he got. And this is before bore sighting and after bore sighting. You can see that there are now two targets as there should be. And not only are there only two targets, but both of the targets are much clearer, they're much sharper, they're square as they should be. So all is good with that. And now we can see the full data set. So the previous one was with a reflectivity filter. So you could only see very reflective objects such as the targets. But this is the uh, ordinary point cloud. So you can see there's a van in the top here. There's a car over on the top right. Uh, these are very, they're very blurry images and almost uh, merging into two images there. This is before bore sighting. And you can see that this point cloud is pretty much unusable for just about any application you can think of. And yet after bore sighting, we have one car very clearly, one van very clearly with features such as a, a window and a door. And we've got these targets which are very clearly square and two targets. We can even make out now that there's a road and trees, for example. So that's what boresight calibration can do. So this is our solution. A data-driven technique that we've made for calibrating the angles. And the procedure is very simple. So you set up these flat, square, retroreflective targets, uh, as you see in the, the right side there. So they're very primitive targets. And then you have your LiDAR device. So on the left here, you can see we've mounted it on the rear window of the car. And the idea is that you will drive around or fly your UAV around and try to get the LiDAR to view the target at as many distances and as many angles as you can. And then you just go to georeferencer and process that. And you'll come up in about a couple of minutes with the correct angles. So we now have a demonstration. So we have some data taken by a Survey Plus INS and a VLP16. So we'll show that now. So this is Cloud Compare. And what we're doing here is viewing a point cloud before and after using our bore sighting. So 
what you can see is only highly reflective objects in the point cloud. We've filtered everything else out. So this should be a nice square flat target. And as you can see, it's not, it's a big mess. You can see there are several versions of the target. It's starting to blur down to the right a bit. So the different colors mean different things. So blue is when the LIDAR is very close. So you can see that's the best data. Green is when the LIDAR is a bit further away. That's like second best data. And then up to red where the LIDAR is probably about 20 meters away. And we're seeing a displacement of the target center by about the target size, which would be about 80 centimeters. So that's quite a significant error. And if we now look at the four-sided solution, you can see that it's square, it's flat, and at all ranges, the points are in the target where they should be. So now if we look at GeoReferencer, so we need to put in our five files. So if we just drag those in. So we've got here an INS file, a LIDAR file, we've got our position that we measured, we've got our angles that we measured, and we've got another file which comes from the INS. So on this right side, you can see a map of where we were dri driving around. So it's on our airfield. We had a target, I think, here, and a target here. And we were driving around and trying to get the LIDAR to view the targets from as many directions and distances as possible. So if we look in the hardware tab, we can see here, yeah, you can see that we have the Survey Plus in the back of the car, in the boot or the trunk. And on the rear window, we have the LiDAR. And these are the positions we measured, and these are the angles you measure. You can see we can move those around and the difference between say 90 and 92 is extremely negligible. You can't really see it by eye and that makes a huge difference in your point cloud. So if I now run the boresight calibration, so the whole boresighting process, depending on your computer, uh, will take a varying amount of time. Uh, this should take about 30 seconds. So what it's doing here, it's looking at LIDAR data you've taken, and it's screening it for all the points that had a very high intensity reflection. And so what that should do is filter out the targets. So we're only looking at the targets. So in the next part of the process, you can see in this window, red points are the high intensity points. So we are prompted to tell the software where the targets were. And the targets are these quite obvious uh, clusters of points. And these strips here are retroreflective strips that we have on our airfield. So what you have to do is ensure that the targets are within this blue search radius and ensure that nothing else that is retroreflective is in that search radius. So we can change the size of that and then choose the altitude. Uh, this for most cases won't be necessary and you'll just choose the middle bar. And then you click check target points. So this will tell you how many points the LiDAR has seen on each of these targets. And then you click Continue Boresight. So in this window, we can see a chart, which is a visualization of the angles and the distances at which the LiDAR has seen the targets. So you can see there's a gap in the data here. That's because it's mounted on the rear window and a significant arc of the LiDAR is going to be looking at the sky and not seeing any re reflections from that. And then 
180 degrees on the other side, you're going to get most points hitting the floor, so very close. So now that's the whole bore sighting process complete, and we'll just look at some angles. So these are the angles we had before. So this is the best that we could do by eye, and we had 90, 0, and 55. And the bore sighting has taken that to 88.7, minus 0 0.4, and 54.86. So these are not possible or extremely difficult to get without doing a data-driven calibration technique. And these angles are not significantly different, as you can see. And yet in the, in the point cloud, you can see very significant differences. So that was the demonstration. As a summary, the blurring and double vision that you can get from having an imprecision in your angles that you measure can make a lot of applications impossible to complete or extremely difficult. And we'll need some way of making the angles better. And a data-driven technique is not just the uh, easiest, uh, time-wise, but it is also the most effective. So this would be for um, uses such as object classification, so lanes, road signs, cars, barriers, trees, these kinds of things that you want to look for objects in your point cloud automatically or by eye. You need to have the objects separate and distinct, so they can't be blurring into each other. Uh, other uses such as Taking volume measurements or distances will, of course, be quite difficult if there is significant blurring or if there's two of the same object, that would make things quite difficult. So what we provide is this data-driven calibration technique that gets your angles as precisely as they can to make your data as good as it can be. And there's a very simple procedure that can be added onto any survey run. So if you've got uh, any questions, you could ask them in the chat, or we'll uh, hopefully get some emailed answers to you. Or you, if you've got questions and you don't want to ask us specifically, you can take these links um, and have a look for answers there. And if you don't find them, then please get, get in contact. So if we now go to questions, yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, that was brilliant, Jay. Thank you very much for that. Um, as everybody saw, the um, if you want to ask some questions, you want to mail me, um, my address was there, uh, pwood at oxts.com. Just drop me a line or indeed get in touch with any of our, of our partners. Um, they would also be able to help. And if they can't, they'll come back to us anyway. So we'd be more than happy to, uh, to assist. Um, Mm -hmm. um, so we have some um, questions that are quite common. Uh, so one that we get is, uh, how long does the procedure take? So um, I think if I show, we, we have this um, driving around that we have to do. And we normally say this takes about five minutes. So what we've done here is a bit excessive just to make sure that we see every angle and every distance. But it doesn't even have to be five minutes. It can sometimes take one or two minutes. Um, it really depends on how good you can maneuver the vehicle and the LIDAR into, the, into getting a view of targets. Um, so we have another question. Is what altitude should I fly my UAV at and how long will it take? Um, so again, you, you want to get your range of distances as good as you can, um, which say at least cover the ranges that you expect to be surveying at. So if you're going to fly your UAV at 20 meters, then fly at 15 to 25 meters over the targets, for example. And it can it can be as long as 
you can do the the maneuvers as long as you want. It won't get much better after a couple of minutes. That'll be that'll be enough. But um, you, you can try to make it as good as possible. Um, we've got yeah a couple more. Uh, can I use a different INX uh, INS so not OXTS? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, so if you see in this top left corner, you need NCOM, which is our own data format that we have. Um, and another question is, what LIDAR are compatible with uh, with your INSs? So uh, at the moment, it's only a VLP 16. We are currently working on implementing uh, all of Velodyne's range all of Auster's range, uh, Hesai, we've got a whole whole bunch that are, that are in the works. If you're thinking that you you really want a specific lidar to be integrated, then please get in touch, and we'll we'll bump that up on the uh, priority list. Uh, so we've got some questions. Um, could we replace the square target by several road signs? So this is something that we are looking into, actually. Yes. Uh, so right now you can't do that, but uh, we we are looking to do that. But we'll see if uh, that's feasible. Uh, what are the specifications of the target? So at the moment, um, all you need is flat and square and retro reflective. Uh, so you can get some retro reflective tape just off of Amazon and put that on some some target, which we, we've done that, uh, just got some tape and put it on some uh, square wooden targets. Um, they don't need to have fixed dimensions, um, just flat, square, retro reflective. Um, and we're trying to make that more flexible. Uh, yeah, one, one point would be that uh, the smaller the target is, the uh, higher the ratio of noise would be to the dimension of the target. Um, and that could that could uh, make the calibration um, less precise. So the targets that we use are 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters. Uh, that's not necessary though. Uh, do you have plans to make this available for other lasers? Yes, uh, yes. So like the like the like the Alster, uh, we we plan to integrate Alster. Yep, that's uh, a high priority on our list. Um, okay, that's that looks like all the questions that we've got here. Um, if you've got any more, just throw them in the in the chat. But uh, oh, here's one. <clears throat> Do you have plans to make intrinsic calibration? Um, I'm not sure what that means. I I think that might mean perhaps using the environment, maybe not using the targets. Um. So that is also something we're looking into. Um, in the short term, I don't think that's going to happen. But um, yeah, that, that's something we're going to investigate. Yeah, um, OK, so that looks to be all the, oh, oh some more questions. <laughs> uh, are there a minimum number of targets? Uh, one would be the minimum number of targets. Um, oh, the internal calibration of individual channels. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, no, is the short answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, not not in the near term, certainly. So. Um, yeah, if that's all the questions, then anything else, um, yeah, please, please get in contact. But um, yeah, uh, can you use? Right. Okay. Um, have we have we oh, had a, I don't know, have we had all the all the questions, Jake? I don't know, there are a couple more. Uh, yeah. So there's another question. Uh, just one last question. Uh, can we use your method for terrestrial uh, mobile laser scanning? Uh, yes. That's that's what we've done here. Um, yeah. 
in, okay, in the nice. example. Thanks very much, Jake. That's really, really cool. Um, thank you very much for uh, for attending, everybody. Um, please do get in touch with us um, through email, through the website, um, through LinkedIn. Um, drop us a message through the partners. We'd be more than happy to talk. We'll be in touch anyway. And this um, this presentation and the, uh, the re a recording of this will be uh, posted online uh, in a day or so. So please watch out, we'll let you all know. Um, thank you very, very much for, for giving us some time this afternoon or this morning. Um, I know things are really, really tough with everybody kind of working at home and being restricted in what they're doing at the moment. So I hope you're all staying well. <clears throat> hope you're all staying safe. Um, let's, um, let's get ourselves through this and we'll meet at the next show whenever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just one last question I've got. Um, so does it work for more than one laser scanner? Um, so we haven't got batch processing, but you can certainly process them separately and then combine them into one point cloud. So yeah, I think we will end this here.